Well, good morning once again, everybody. You probably heard the phrase before, the devil's in the details. Uh, I get it. I don't think I fully ascribe to that because I know somebody else is in the details too. I mean, you just look at an insect, you look through a microscope, you look at human DNA, you know, the sequencing of the human genome. And how many of you know God is in the details, right? God is in the details way more than the devil could ever be. But I also get the other side of the coin. You know, Solomon, for instance, in all his wisdom, he said this. He said, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. Today's message is called Faith for the Little Things. Let's pray before we study. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this time in your presence. We thank you for your love, for your care for your intricate involvement in all the details of our lives. We thank you for your anointing, for the gifts that you give to all of us, for how you activate those gifts. Lord, draw us nearer now through the ministry and power of your word by the presence of your spirit and in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand and Usher will bring you a Bible. If you don't have a Bible of your own, just take this one with you as our gift to you today. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians is an amazing chapter in the Bible. Philippians chapter 2 specifically. Um, I memorized quite a bit of it back when I was 20, 21 years old. Um, Philippians chapter 2 is about the incarnation of Jesus. So it, it, it's, it's Christmas according to Paul. And, and being that it's uh, 344 shopping days until Christmas, I thought we'd get an early start this year. But after Paul talks about Jesus coming from heaven to earth, after he talks about how he humbled himself and took upon him human nature, how he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and therefore was given the name which is above all names. I want you to see how Paul immediately follows that up in verses 12 and 13. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Work out your salvation. Notice he did not say work for your salvation. You can only work out something you already have. We can only work out what God has already first worked in. Um, so, and Paul says here specifically, work out your own salvation. The word salvation is the Greek word sozo. And it's one of those big Bible words because we think of salvation oftentimes in a very limited way. We think of salvation as, oh, I get to go to heaven. And that's a huge part of it. But salvation is not just for heaven. Salvation also applies right here in the here and now because the word sozo is a word that is inclusive for all the blessings of God bestowed upon mankind in Christ. Jesus. So what is Paul saying? He's saying, listen, whatever God has deposited in you, all the gifts, all the blessing, every benefit, we are to work those things out into every area of our lives. But understand this, everything that God has worked in, it is all by grace. Everything you have from him has been freely given to you. It's unearned, it is undeserved, it is not by works lest any man should boast. It's, so listen, let's get real practical. It is never, oh, you know why that happened? Because I prayed. Oh, oh, oh now that I've been reading the Bible more, I know God will bless me. I did this, so now God will do that. It is never that. Yeah, when you do that, when you say, oh, this happened because I prayed or because I read more, you know what you're saying? Because of something I did, now God is in my debt. And I'm here to tell you today, God is never in our debt. Every good and perfect gift, every spiritual blessing, all things that pertain to life and godliness come to you, not because of what you do or don't do, but because of what Jesus Christ already did 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross. It's all by sheer grace. So, 
whether it's Bible reading or meditation like we talked about last week or prayer, every spiritual discipline is a response to grace. It's always God first. God doesn't respond to us. We respond to what he has already done in Christ. And that's why the gospel is good news, not good advice. How many of you know the gospel is good news, not good advice? See, good advice, if you're giving somebody advice, you're telling them, hey, here's some advice. You should do this. Advice is something for you to do. News is a report of something that's already been done. 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Say that aloud with me today. today. Ready? We love because he first loved us. See, we serve. Because he first served us. He said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. We serve because he first served us. We give because he first gave to us. For God so loved the world that he gave. We give because he, we forgive because he first forgave us. So back to Philippians chapter 2. Ready? What God has worked, at, worked in, we are to work out in every part of our lives. In other words, into your identity, into your psychology, into what you believe. You're to work it into how you react to adverse circumstances. You're to work it into how you resolve conflict. Work it into your relationships, into your marriage, into how you parent your kids. What God, by His grace, has worked into our lives, each of us is to work out into how you manage your time, into how you manage your finances, into how you form your worldview, into your sociology, how you react to social injustice or to race relationships or equality issues. You, you, you work it out. You, you work it out into how you treat other people. You work it out into how you talk to yourself, your self-talk. You work it out into you know, your actions and your reactions and your behaviors into every arena, every expression, every aspect of who you are, every nook and cranny of your life. Paul says you, you got to work it out. Matter of fact, turn to somebody next to you and say, you better work it out. Go ahead, tell you, say, you better work it out. You better work it. You better work it. No, really, you have to do the work. Let me just stop there for a moment. You have to do the work. I mean, and if you've been here over the last couple of weeks in this series, Soul Tending, you know this is, we're not, this is a challenge, man. You have to do the work. People just think that stuff just falls out of heaven on your pretty little head and wham, you're changed. Well, it just doesn't work like that. It works like gardening, like agriculture. Yeah. You got to work. You got to do the work. Not, listen, not works, but work. Yes. There's a humongous difference. In Philippians 2 and verse 12, here, Paul calls the work, ready, obedience. He calls it obedience. As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So this is what we're talking about, soul tending. What we've been talking about um, in this series are spiritual disciplines, and, and we do not like the word discipline. But the truth of the matter is that discipline is the root word of disciple. And, you know, and that's, it's what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. It's what it means to be a real believer. And, and there's a whole arsenal of spiritual disciplines. Study and meditation, what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, those are spiritual disciplines. But so is prayer and confession and acts of compassion and the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Those are spiritual disciplines. Serving, you know, being an active participant, a, a functioning member of the body of Christ. Those are all disciplines and they are all responses to grace. So if week one of this series was transformation by heart preparation, we talked about the four different kind of hearts that Jesus spoke about. And if week number two is transformation by meditation, well then today is going to be transformation by application. Because when you do the disciplines we've been talking about, when you meditate the scriptures, 
When you let his word dwell in you, you know, you're not just speed reading through the Bible. You're not just reading in a detached way. You're not just reading in some sort of perfunctory way that, you know, because you have to. But when you let his word dwell in you, take up residence on the inside of you, when you attentively listen with an undivided heart, when you make it a priority to hear God by hearing his word, well, the end result is this. It's Romans 10, 17. Read it aloud with me. Ready? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Come on, everybody together. Ready? Let's do it again. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. A heart that is changed. A heart that is good ground. A hearing heart ends in faith. It's conducive to faith. It produces faith. It's the Petri dish for faith. And therefore, faith is born in the fertile soil of a hearing heart. Let me give you a couple examples. Jesus is coming through town one day, and there's a man who's blind from birth. We know him as blind Bartimaeus. And the Bible specifically says, when he heard of Jesus. Will you say that with me? When he heard of Jesus. Say it again. When he heard of When he heard. Immediately, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So the moment he heard of Jesus, something rose up in his heart and said, you know what? There's a man who could heal my blindness. I can see an impossibility suddenly becomes possible. Faith rises up when somebody hears of Jesus. Same is true with the woman of the issue, with the, the issue of blood, right? She's bleeding for 12 years, uterine bleeding for 12 years, all the red flags for uterine cancer. She's been to the doctor. She's spent all her money. She has not gotten any better. As a matter of fact, she's gotten worse. And not only does she have a physical condition, she has a social condition because her bleeding makes her ceremonially unclean. So she can't go out in public. She can't leave the house. You know, she can't, she, nobody can sit on a seat that she sat on. Nobody can lie on a bed that she lies on. She has to stay in the house because she's unclean and uncleanness was considered transmissible. So if she touched anybody or anybody touched her, they'd become unclean. And the Bible again says this specifically, when she heard of Jesus, say it with me, when she heard of Jesus, she began to say in her heart, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I know I shall be made well. Imagine that. I mean, I, I think sometimes we read the Bible with rosy colored glasses and we hear these stories in Sunday school and we're like, yeah, 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 it's great, it's a miracle. But she's, she's been like this for 12 years. No possibility of a relationship, no possibility of bearing children. 12 years, she's tried everything. She could, but suddenly, <laughs> suddenly she hears of Jesus and says, oh, I know I can be made well. If I just touch them. And so when Jesus comes into town, she's been saying this. It, it transformed her self-talk. I know, I know. If I just touch the hem of his garment, I know I shall be. I know it, I know it. If I, just, if I could just touch it. And when he comes to town and there's a great crowd pressing around him, guess what? That faith that now has risen up in her heart causes her to break all the rules. She comes out of the house and makes it through that crowd, pushing people aside. Excuse me, pardon me, excuse me. Unclean, unclean, unclean. And she gets behind him and touches the tassels on his prayer prayer shawl, and immediately, wham, the condition is completely made well. Jesus whirls around in the crowd and says, who touched me? The conversation ends with him turning towards her and saying, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Faith comes by hearing. Faith. Hebrew says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it's substance. Faith is substance. It's substantive. It's weighty. It, 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 it's matter in the non-material realm, in the realm of the spirit. Hebrews also goes on to say that without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So again, without faith, it's impossible to please him. So guess what? With faith, you please him. How many of you know God is pleased when we trust him? 
And here, let me pause here as well. I may do a lot of pausing today. I don't know. But, but let me, you know, it's not, like, it's not like God is saying, oh, I hope they trust me. I hope that. How many of you know God is not insecure? Right? right? He doesn't need your trust. You know why he is pleased when you trust him? Because that's what's best for you. It's all, I, I believe it's like this. I believe God is saying, oh, he trusts me. Good. He gets it. He's not freaking out like he used to. He's growing. And that pleases the heart of God. I mean, in the John epistles, it says, the Holy Spirit speaking through John the Beloved says, I have no greater joy than to see that my children walk in truth. It pleases God when we trust him. Faith is the God-given ability to trust him. It's leaning not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledging him. In other words, acknowledging his presence and acknowledging his power and his, acknowledging his ability, acknowledging his willingness to intercede on your behalf. Biblical faith, it's not mere credence. It's not, of course, I believe. It's not just checking a bunch of, of doctrinal boxes. It's not simply mentally agreeing with a set of beliefs. That's not what it is. Biblical faith is not mere credence. It is total reliance. It's, 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 it's like the old song says, leaning on the everlasting arms. It's entrusting him with everything. And therefore... Faith is the primary expression of obedience. Faith, especially under the New Covenant, especially in the New Testament, faith is the primary expression of obedience. Now, now, now there's another word that we don't like, obedience, right? I mean, we like faith. We like the word faith. We, we like that. We like words like faith. We like hope. We like grace. We like mercy. We like love. We like, we like last week's word. If you were here last week, last week's word was meditation. We like meditation. Meditation's like a cool word, right? Cool people meditate, right? Right? Obedience? Not so much. But why? Why, 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 why isn't obedience chill? Why, why not? Why, why do we recoil and cringe when we hear the word obedience? And I'm going to tell you exactly why. The reason why we cringe and recoil from a word like obedience is because we have adopted our culture's definition of what obedience is. We've been squeezed into the world's mold. Our, our culture defines obedience as something that limits your life. And the Bible defines obedience as something that takes the limits off of your life. Yes. Take a look at Isaiah 119. Let's read it together. Ready? If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. See, obedience to God isn't limiting. It's not constricting. It's not imprisoning. It's actually the opposite. It's freeing. It's liberating. Listen carefully. Everybody lives for something. Everybody does. Everybody obeys something. Everyone has a main thing that they live for, that gives them joy, that gives them identity. Everyone has something at their center, your, your emotional center. And whatever that is, it is your authority. You have to have it. It drives you. If anything threatens it, you experience fear. For instance, if money is that thing, if money is at the center, and something threatens your financial security, you begin to worry. If it's your career, and something threatens to derail your career, what, you get scared. If it's acceptance, and something threatens what people will think of you, you get anxious. Listen carefully. Listen, this is not on your outline. This is not a PowerPoint, but it should be. Ready? Ready? If you are not under the authority of the true Lord who can both forgive and fulfill you, you are under the spiritual authority of some other Lord who can't. I'm just going to say it again. Ready? If you are not under the authority of the true Lord who can both forgive and fulfill you, you are under the spiritual authority of some other Lord who can't. And those are your only two options. You are either following the orders of one or the other. You are obeying one or the other. Now watch this. In Psalm 119, verse 45, and there's a lot of verses like this in Psalm 119, but just look at this one. The psalmist writes this. He says, And I will walk at liberty. 
The Message Bible there says, I will stride freely through wide open spaces, for I seek your precepts. See, the psalmist is not saying, I gave up my freedom to obey you. He's saying, I now walk at liberty. I, I, I now walk in wide open spaces. I now have options. My path is, 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 is not confined. I have freedom because I've sought to obey your precepts. I'm finally free because I bound myself to you, which sounds weird, but it's not. He's saying, I'm free now. Now that I am your servant, I'm free now because I'm your servant. I, I used to be a slave to fear because there were things that I thought I had to have. I used to be a slave to resentment because there were certain things that I thought I had to have and if anybody got in my way, I couldn't get over my anger. I, I used to be a slave to guilt because I could never live up. But now that you are my master, nothing else masters me. Now that I obey you, nothing else can order me around. See, there are things I thought I had to have, but now, now I have options. I can take things. I can leave things. Oh, I can have things, but things can never have me. Wide open spaces. Now I can live a big life. See, freedom is not the lack of restrictions. Freedom is finding the right restrictions. Let me say that again. Freedom is not a lack of restrictions. Freedom is finding the right restrictions. The things to obey that fit your being. Let me give you an example. Uh, gliders. How many of you know gliders are cool? Right? Gliders are amazing. A glider is an amazing picture of freedom, isn't it? Think about it. Why is a glider... An engineless, propellerless plane, why is it able to soar? Not because of the lack of restrictions, because it's actually honoring the aerodynamic laws of air currents. It's functioning in, it is even being propelled by the laws of aerodynamics. How many of you know if the glider does not obey the laws of aerodynamics, it will not glide? Are you following me? Are you all just watching the video and not hearing a word I'm saying? You're like, yeah, dude, I got to do that. We should do that. No, 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 come on. Stay with me here. The reason why a glider glides is because it obeys the laws of aerodynamics. If you take a glider and you put it in the water, it'll sink. Listen carefully. It is functioning within and even propelled by the laws of aerodynamics. It was built for the air currents. And it is in the environment it was built for. And because it's in the environment it was built for, it soars. You see, it's free. Not because of a lack of restrictions. It's free because it is functioning in the environment that it was built for. And can I just tell you something? You were built for. You were designed. You were woven together. You were handcrafted. You were made for a scripturally defined relationship with God. That is the one and only environment you were crafted for. You were made to soar within the confines of his authoritative precepts. I mean, if you think about it, yeah, the glider does amazing things in its environment, but it cannot compare with what you can do in your environment, in the environment that you were created for. You can do amazing things in the environment of the precepts of God's Word. Do you know that? It doesn't look like it. <laughs> uh, let me just give you a few examples because it's mind-blowing. Really? I mean, if you think about it, you know what the Bible says you can do? The Bible says that you can speak life into situations. You can do that. Death and life are in the power. You can speak life into situations. You can be at 
perfect peace in the midst of utter chaos. You can tap into the wisdom of the ages. It's at your disposal. It's there for you. Let's take it a few steps further. The Bible says, Jesus, and this, may, this is going to stretch you, those of you who grew up in mainline denominations, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but you may want to buckle your seatbelt because, but this is the B-I-B-L-E, okay, ready? This is in the, matter of fact, this is not just the Bible, this is in red. These are the words of Jesus. Yeah, Mark chapter 16, Jesus said, those who believe in my name, so you don't need an REV in front of your name. You don't need a doctor of divinity behind your name. Those who believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's not a charismaniac idea. That's a Jesus idea. In your environment, you could. Do. Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also and greater works than these because I go to my Father. You can be used by God to change people's eternal destiny when you lead them to the Lord. You can be used by God to plunder hell and populate heaven. The Bible says the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 32. The Bible says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Ready? The human soul soars in the obedience of God. You could do amazing things. You could become an amazing person. But it will not happen in any other environment than the one your creator created you for. Think about it like this. There's a little five-year-old boy. He goes down to the block to his friend's house. And at the friend's house, they just had a, a, a litter of kittens. So there's little kittens, and he's on the floor with his buddy, and they're, they're playing with the kittens. The kittens are just frolicking all around. And he just, he's just having the time of his life. And he goes home. He's a little swollen, you know, and, and it just looks like, oh, maybe he's allergic to kittens. Mom gives him a little Benadryl. He's okay. The next day, though, he goes to another friend's house down the other end of the block where their, their dogs just had a puppy. And so there's a, there's a little puppy now, and he's frolicking around, and the kid's playing with the puppy. He's having the time of his life. And he goes home again, a little swollen red, you know, and all that. Mom gives him Benadryl. Obviously, he uh, he's, he's must be allergic to fur. But then he looks at his mom and says, Mom, I had so much fun with the, with the kittens. I had so much fun with the puppies. Mom, I need a pet. To which she thinks, okay, he's allergic to he needs, I can't resist him. He needs a, oh. what does she do? She goes and gets him goldfish, right? Right? She gets him goldfish. And she puts the goldfish in his room in that nice little bowl. And she says, here's your pets, honey. I'm going to go prepare dinner. You know, have, have a nice time with your brand new pets. <laughs> See, parents already know what's going to happen here. You know what's happening here. After she calls him down for dinner, you know what happens, right? He comes in the kitchen wet. She says, well, did you have a nice time with your pets? And he says, yes, Mommy, I had a really nice time at first. At first, they were very friendly, and they flopped all over the place. But now they're just laying on the rug. (laughs) I guarantee you those fish thought there was freedom outside of the bowl. (laughs) Right? There's definitely a scene from Finding Nemo, right, like that. I got to get out of this bowl, right? But the fish didn't experience freedom when they got out of that narrow, confining, restricting aquarium because the fish's being was violated being outside of the water. The human soul soars in obedience to God. Now, let me explain it like this too. God does not say, I am the Lord, you are my servants, so I must have rules. Let me think of some rules Yes, yes, you must forgive. That is my rule. You must forgive everyone who does anything against you. You must forgive. I am the Lord. You are not. These are my rules. You must forgive. God doesn't do that. That's not God. God is saying, listen, I built the human heart. 
I created your psychology. I created your emotions. I built the world of human relationships. I created how you are to relate to one another. And if you don't forgive, you are violating the very dynamics of creation and your created being. You're violating yourself when you don't forgive. You're tearing down your own structure. Listen, you're a goldfish lying on the rug when you don't forgive. <laughs> See, my commands for you are like water to the goldfish, like air currents for you to glide in and soar. See, because it is only when you live in the environment that you were created for and the environment that was created for you that you'll ever be truly free. That's biblical obedience. And take it one step further with me. Because when you see the obedience of Jesus, it will change you. When you really see the obedience of Jesus, it transforms your obedience. The Bible says that he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. The Bible says in Philippians 2 that he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So he was obedient through that unbelievably excruciating physical pain. He, he was obedient through that, that unimaginable, infinite spiritual pain. He, was, he remained obedient. He still on that cross cried out, my God, my God. He still called God his God on that. He still forgave. He still believed that that day he would be in paradise. He, he loved God completely through it all. He loved you completely through it all. When you see his obedience, it should hit you right in the heart. Man, it should leave a mark. It should, it should, it should affect you deeply. It should break you down in a really good way. Because my family, obedience is a love response. Say that with me today. Obedience is a love response. Say it again. Obedience is a love response. See, it wasn't the nails. It was the love for the Father and the love for you that kept Jesus on the cross. And when you see that you are loved like that, it melts your heart and it disconnects all the other superficial allegiances. Obedience is a love response. Let me just give you a quick illustration. Um, when people fall in love, when you fell in love, when I fell in love, I remember, uh, let me just use me, but this is not just about me. This is about everybody who falls in love. But when I first met Elena, whether I knew it or not, I was doing like a mental tally, a mental accounting. I was forming an outline in my mind of what she likes and what she doesn't like, what brings her joy and what brings her anything but joy. Right? And you're watching, and you're, and you're listening, right, when you're falling in love. You're listening for that. You're checking it. Be, why? Because you want to know that person so that, let's just be honest, so you can conform to the laws of their nature. You don't want, whatever you do, you don't want to, because you're falling, you don't want to come against the laws of their nature. So, you're making that list. You're looking for verbal, you're listening for verbal cues. You're looking at nonverbal cues, and you're, you're like... Yeah, 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 I like those books too. Yeah, yeah, I do. I like, me too. Yeah, I've read that, yeah. Oh, yeah, that kind of, yeah. <laughs> I have that on, you know, back then. I have that on my iPod too, you know, right? And, you know, and so, and you, you're, you're learning all those things. And, and, and then it's like, I, I bought you this. <laughs> I bought you this. And you may have gone out of your way. It may have, you might have had gone to 10 stores to buy the thing, gone through all, these, all this inconvenience. And guess what? It wasn't an inconvenience. It was a joy. Your burdens were not burdensome. Just to bring delight just to see her smile. And really, what was the point of doing all of that? To go deeper into the love relationship. Because you're in love, so you want to you go deeper into the love relationship. You don't ever think of that as obeying. You wouldn't dare think of yourself as obeying, and here's why, because you have adopted the world's definition of obedience. The truth is, 
that is exactly what you're doing. You're obeying the laws of the other person's nature. And when? It's not just in a human relationship. But when you obey God, not out of law, but out of love. When you obey as a love response to the one who first loved you, when you are obedient to the one who was obedient unto death for you, can I just tell you something? You're swimming like a fish and soaring like a glider. Yeah. Obedience is a love response. And the human soul soars in obedience of God. So let's connect the dots, okay? Once again, the primary expression of obedience is faith. So here are the questions. Ready? So, so let me frame it up like this. In order to obey God, to respond to God in obedience, here's the question. Will you trust God over your circumstances? Will you trust God over other people? Will you trust God over money? Will you trust God over yourself? Now watch this because this, here's where we're going to land the plane today. Romans 16, starting in verse 25, where it says, Now to God who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but is now disclosed and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God, look at this next phrase, to bring about obe the obedience of faith, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever. Amen. That's how the book of Romans ends. Stay with me here. The book of Romans is like a thesis on what it means to be a Christian. You could argue it's, it's, it's one of, if not the most important book in all the Bible. You could make an argument. And Paul, with his last two verses in this book, is saying, okay, okay, here's the doxology, which means basically here's the summary Everything I wrote to you, everything by the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit that I revealed, that I instructed, that I showed you throughout this incredible book, let me just boil it all down. Here's the reason why I wrote it all. It is to bring about the obedience of faith. This is the purpose, to bring about the obedience of faith. They're his final words, so that we would obey by trusting so that we would obey by entrusting the totality of our lives to the only wise God through Jesus Christ. But I also want to tell you this. How many of you have, have figured this out already? That does not happen overnight. You don't bring everything under the obedience of faith overnight. It does not happen that way. There's, you know, there's not like a magical podcast that you can listen to and wham, you're all better. And there's not, there's not some sort of, you know, blessed blog that you could read. That it all happened. There's not even one super anointed service where somebody lays their hands on your head and wham, you're all better. It doesn't happen like that. Jesus said it happens like seed in soil. Jesus actually said, he said this, listen carefully. He said, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Ready? This is a mustard seed. And you're saying, yeah, I can't see it. Exactly. That's the point. I am actually holding a mustard seed. Paul said to the Thessalonians, he says, because your faith grows exceedingly. Here's what the scripture is saying. Your faith may start out as minuscule, but it can grow into something monumental. Something weighty, something substance, something of consequence, even mountain moving in the spiritual realm. But again, that doesn't happen next day delivery. It doesn't happen instant download. It happens organically. Here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, like a tree that starts as a seed. And that's why it is of utmost importance, my family, to step out in faith for the little things. For the little things. You have to start somewhere, and then it's built over time. It's something that grows. And James said, if you do not act on your faith, then in essence, it's useless. It's dead. You've got to start somewhere. You've got to act on what you believe. 
Jesus said that if we would be faithful in the little things, we'd be made ruler over much. And I know that when we hear the word faithful, we think loyal, dedicated, committed. And yeah, and all that's very, very important. But in the context that Jesus said, be faithful in the little things, the word there means to be full of faith, to exercise faith in the little things. I, I, this week, I'd studied on Wednesday for hours and hours and had a direction I was going in. And then Thursday morning before I got out of the house, I heard something so clear in my heart. I heard it. I heard it in my heart. Exercise faith in the little things. And it, I, it literally stopped me in my tracks. And the next thing I heard was this, because if you do not exercise faith in the little things, what will happen when and if bigger challenges come? And I knew it was the Lord, and I knew, I knew he was talking to me for me in a certain area that I needed a little nudge in, but I also knew it was for us. I knew it was for you. Exercise faith in the little things because if you don't, what will happen when the bigger challenges come? Several things started cascading into my mind. Think about it. Think about Abraham when he's Abram. First time you read about Abram in your Bible, he's living in Ur of the Chaldees with his father Terah with probably a large clan of family, and he hears a voice. He doesn't know who the voice is. He doesn't know who God is. He doesn't know who the, the, the God of the Israelites. There are no Israelites. He's like the, the, he's like the original. So, so he, all he knows is he hears a voice. Abram, Abram, get thee up out of thy country and thy kindred and go to a land that I will yet show you. In other words, okay, so get up from where you are, leave Ur of the Chaldees, leave your family, and, and just go. I'm not going to tell you where. I'll tell you where later. Just start going somewhere. And he does. Pretty much. Pretty much. He takes Lot, his nephew, with him. Mistake. Big problems. But anyway, he gets up and he goes. He has faith in a little thing. And I know that some of us are thinking, that doesn't sound too little to me. That sounds like kind of a big deal. Well, I understand that, but it's not a big deal compared to the other things that later on in his life he's going to have to trust God for. It's a real little thing compared to when God will say to him, at 99 years old, you're about to have a son. I'm going to change your name from Abram to Abraham. You're going to become the father of many nations. And Abraham, he talks, he says, well, you know, Lord, I don't even have one. I don't even have a son. And the Lord says, let's go outside, take a look at the stars. Can you count them? No. So shall your descendants be. And the next verse in your Bible says, and Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know what he would have done in that moment if he hadn't trusted God in the little things. And then when the son comes, Isaac is born, and God says to him, now take your son, your only son, the son whom you love, and sacrifice him on the mountain to me. I don't know what I would have said. The Bible doesn't record Abraham's reaction other than he took his son and loaded him up with wood, and took a torch, and took some other men with him, and they started to march towards Mount Moriah. And on the way there, Abraham turns towards his attendants and says, now you stay here, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will return to you. And the New Testament tells us because in that moment, Abraham believed that even if he had to sacrifice his son, God was able to raise his son from the dead. And he takes the boy up the mountain, and as they're going up, Isaac says, hey, Pop, uh, got the wood, got the torch, so where's the sacrifice? And he looks right back at his son, and he says, the Lord will provide. And he lays his son down on the wood, and he goes to take the knife out, and suddenly, Abraham, Ibrahim, Ibrahim, now I know that you put me first. And there's the sound of a ram in the thicket. And Abraham called that place 
Yehovah Yireh, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. But I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know what Abraham would have done in that moment if he hadn't exercised faith for the little things. David, his three older brothers are in Saul's army. And the Israelites are on one side of a mountain and the Philistines are on the other side and the Philistines send out a champion into the valley for 40 days. He barks blasphemies at the Israelites. Goliath of Gath. He's in the valley. The Bible says he's six cubits and a hand tall. Ready? You ready for this? That's nine foot eight inches. The dude has some pituitary gland issues or something. I don't know, but he is a massive. Especially in a day where the average human being, the average male human being was five feet tall. And he's barking out blasphemies for days. So Jesse, you know, the dad says to David, the youngest, hey, go bring your, your brothers some food, bring them some wheat, 10 loaves, 10 cheeses, bring them some grilled cheese, and put, load up your little red flyer wagon and head off to the battle. And, and, and as David's rolling up, he's starting to hear Goliath of Gath. And he's like, what's up with that? How does a Philistine dare talk to the armies of the living God like that? And so he goes up to his brother, and his brother is like immediately, what are you doing here? What are you doing, what are you, what are you doing here? What are you, just some, some sort of ambulance chaser? You just want to see the battle? You just want, you bloodthirsty? You know, it's a loose translation, but he just, you know. <laughs> and, and so David looks back at, 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 at his oldest brother, and he, and he says, like a brother would, he's like, what have I done wrong now? But the next thing David says, little David, who, by the way, is somewhere between 13 and 15 years of age. You know, his voice is cracking like Peter Brady. You know, and, he's just, and, and, he, and, 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 he, and he, he says this. Is there not a cause? He says, no one should fear. I'll go fight him. So they bring little David to Saul. And he sa Saul says, what, what are you, you're a youth. This guy's a man of war from his youth. He says, let no one fear. I'll take, I'll take on that uncircumcised giant. Come on. Awesome. Little David says something so interesting to Saul. He says, here's why I know. He says, when I, <laughs> David says, when I used to tend my father's sheep, which I think is hysterical because he, that's where he just came from. <laughs> So I think he's thinking, I'm about to get a really big promotion here because like when I used to tend my father's sheep. He said, one time a lion came and another time a bear came and they took a lamb in their mouth. He says, I went after him. I went after the lion and I went after the bear and I struck him. You know what he said? He said, and when the bear rose up against me, I took him by the beard and I struck him down. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of those. Yeah. Watch, 1 Samuel 17, 36. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Uh, the, the very next verse in your Bible, he says, because the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear shall deliver me from him. Yeah. And you know the story. Saul says, okay, put on this armor. And David's like, I can't wear this armor. I haven't tried it. And he gets five smooth stones and a slingshot. Goliath of Gath with an armor bearer, 125 pounds of metal on him, a helmet, a spear. The head of the spear weighed 15 pounds. All this armor starts saying, what am I, a dog that you came to me with sticks and stones? I see him as De Niro. Hey, what am I, a dog? What are you, you come to me with sticks and stones? What am I, a dog? He says, you come to me with sticks and stones. And, 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 and David says, yeah, but you got all this armor and all this gear and all this. He says, you come to me with, all, with a spear and a helmet. He says, you know what I come to you? I come to you in the name of the living God, the Lord of heaven's armies, which you have defied. And today, I will take your head off and feed your carcass to the birds of the air and the rest of the Philistines to the beasts of the field. 
And the Bible says that David takes that smooth stone and that sling, and he runs at Goliath. He runs at him. Little David with a sling. Bible says the stone sinks into Goliath's head. Goliath goes down. David gets over him. Now, David doesn't have any armor at all. He doesn't have a sword, so he takes Goliath's sword out, which I'm sure took every ounce of energy and strength he had, and whack, he cuts off his head, and he holds it up. And Israel, because they are in David, they get the victory over all the Philistines. Listen, listen, listen. Would David have had the faith to face Goliath if he hadn't had faith to face the lion and the bear? And David didn't run from his big problems in fear. He ran at them in faith because, exactly because he had learned to exercise faith in the little things. So three takeaways as we go. Let's fly through them. You've been a little long-winded today, so... Some of you are a little slow. Number one, number one, ready? Here, if you want to exercise faith in little things, here's number one, ready? You got to go back with grace and locate your last loss. You go back with grace and locate your last loss. Let me just be very quick about this. This is, how many of you know if you don't learn the lessons of history, you're doomed to repeat them? So you go back and you see where you didn't step up where you were not obedient, where you knew what to do and you just chose not to do it, where you bailed on obedience, where you did turn around in fear. But the good news is you can go back and look at that with grace because even though you failed, how many of you know no matter what, you're loved, right? Nothing can separate you from the love of God and there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So now you can go back knowing, yeah, yeah, okay, I can learn the lessons there because even though I missed it, I'm just as loved as if I would have nailed it. Are you following me? So you go back with grace, but you've got to learn the lessons. You've got to learn the lessons. Number two, ready? Start small. Start small. Exercise some mustard seed faith. Let me give you just a couple of examples. The, the next time your child gets sick, okay, uh, definitely take them to the doctors and, 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 and follow the doctor's orders and the medicine and all that, and we're not telling you not to do that. Amen? You do that, but when you do, when you give little Susie the teaspoon of amoxicillin, you give it to her, and then you say, okay, honey, now we're going to pray and you lay your hands on Susie's head, or you take her precious face in your hands, and you say, in the name of Jesus, by whose stripes Susie was healed, I command this sickness to go, and I will give God all the glory. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It's a little thing. It's starting somewhere. You know, again, uh, a real easy example for us is our finances. Our finances. You know, when it comes to tithes and offerings, you got to start somewhere. you got to start somewhere. And again, for some of us, you know, you may be at the place where you've never done that before, or, or at best, you just reach in your pocket and see what you've got in there when the offering bag comes by, and if it's a five, it's a five, if it's a ten, it's a ten, if it's a one, it's a one. But the Bible teaches intentional and systematic giving. That's what the tithe is all about. And so maybe you're not there, and maybe for you to go from zero to 10% is a really big jump for you. Start somewhere. Start in a small thing. Exercise faith for 2% for of your income. And be faithful to the 2%. And then later on, your faith will build. You'll see God provide. You're like, okay, I'm going to go. I'm, 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 I'm going three. I'm going three. Go three. You, you following me? Believe in God for a promotion at work. Hey, do the work. Fill out the applications. Fill out the forms. Do the interviews. Do them well. And believe God because the Bible says promotion does not come from the east or the west. Promotion cometh from the Lord. And so believe God for a promotion, for him to open up new doors of opportunity, new doors of influence for you. Third and finally, if you are facing a giant... Remember your lion and bear victories. If you're facing a giant, 
Remember your lion and bear victories because some of us, we have the luxury right now in this particular season of life where we can start small and we can exercise faith for small things. But there are others of us in in this room that do not have that luxury because right now you're facing a giant. Right now, like you don't really need mustard seed faith. You need the mountain moving faith right now. And if that is the case, I need to speak to you today because I want to promise you something. I want to, listen, this is a, if you are facing a giant or, or a mountain that needs to be moved, this is a prophetic word from the Lord for you. I guarantee you, if you're facing a mountain today, if you're facing a giant today, I guarantee you that you have already had other victories. And you need to recall them, and you need to rehearse them, and you need to remember them. Why? Because sometimes mountains cast a big shadow, and they eclipse our memory of all that God has already done. I'm telling you right now, God has stepped in before. God has shown himself strong on your your behalf before. He's done things for you that you couldn't do for yourself. He has provided. He has made a way when there seemed to be no way. He has healed you before. He has given you peace in the midst of storms before. You have walked on water before. And and maybe the situation then was not quite as daunting as the situation is now. Maybe it's not quite as in your face. Maybe it's not, you know, quite as blasphemously bold as this giant is. But, listen... The God who caused little David to take a bear by the beard is the same God who sunk a smooth stone into Goliath's forehead. Ready? Ready? The size of the battle does not matter to God. I said the size of the battle does not matter to God. It is completely irrelevant. The size of the giant, the size of the mountain, the size of the storm, the size of the tumor, the size of the debt, the size of the tear, the size of the break, the size of the chasm, the size of the challenge, the size of the hurt, the size of the pain is irrelevant because it all infinitely pales in comparison to his love and power. The Bible asks the rhetorical question, is there anything too difficult for the Lord? Does it hinder him to save by many or by few? Is his arm too short for any situation? Listen to me. God has already brought you a long way. And you can be confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Anything he has ever done before, he can do now. Anything he has done anywhere, he can do here. And anything God has ever done for anyone, he can do for you. Oh, get in your glider. Step into the freedom of obedience. Trust God. Start small. Do it this week. Step out in some area this week. Remember, he's already brought you through an awful lot. Don't run from your problems in fear. Run at them in faith. For with God, nothing shall be impossible, and nothing shall be impossible to them that believe.